So I forgot to ask this request last time, and it's rather urgent. Um, it's not finances. It's about the man that I said needed sponsoring, the Ukrainian man. And uh, we did have a sponsor step up, but uh, his background wasn't adequate. He hadn't done his taxes yet, and so we couldn't follow through with it. So the man still needs to be sponsored, and he's been waiting like three or four months now, you know, in order to get over to the States and get away from what's going to be happening here. Please, if any of you are able to, what's, what's required is this. It's not, it doesn't require any money. You don't need to pay any money on your part. There's a form online. I'll send you a link to the form if you say that you're interested. You can go read the form at USCIS website. You can see what's required. And uh, the main thing is that you are earning enough money that you have documented like in your tax return that you made, where you are earning enough money where the size of your household plus one, that's the Ukrainian man, is a hypothetical plus one because he's not actually going to be living with you. He's got money, so he doesn't need that help, but USCIS requires that you meet this requirement. So you have to be making the poverty level or above for the household that you already have, whatever size it is. If it's you and your spouse, it's two. If it's just you, it's one. But then if you add the Ukrainian man as USCIS requires you in order to meet that requirement, then it would be household of two or household of three. And you have to be making that much money or more on your tax form, right? Or bank statement from your bank branch manager saying how much you've got in your account and, and how much you're depositing monthly. And that doesn't come to me at all. I don't get any of that. That goes to, you're going to add that to the form on USCIS website, okay? And so you're going to be doing that. If you need any help, like direction, on a certain question or a certain thing, you know, I can help you with that. That's what we need. We need someone to step up who can do that. And if you have any more questions about it, go ahead and write me at my email, ron.craig at therootedword.com. You'll find it in the About tab on the channel page as, as well. Now on with the lesson. Okay, so I'm going to read to you from Job chapter 31 in the Septuagint today. The first eight verses. I made a covenant with my eyes, and I will not think upon a virgin. Now what portion has God given from above, and is there an inheritance given of the Mighty One from the Highest? Alas, destruction to the unrighteous, and rejection to them that do iniquity. Will he not see my way and number all my steps? But if I had gone with scorners, and if too my foot has hasted to deceit, for I am weighed in a just balance, and the Lord knows my innocence. If my foot was turned aside out of the way, or if mine heart has followed mine eye, and if too I have touched gifts with my hands, then let me sow, and let others eat, and let me be uprooted on the earth. Now, there are a couple problems here in the translation I'm just going to clear up as we go through it and talk about the verses. Verse 1, I made a covenant with my eyes. This says, I placed a contract to my eyes. Like, like made a contract. I placed a contract to my eyes. Put it on it. And I will not think upon a virgin. The word is actually maiden, but you could, by implication, it can be a virgin, but it's, it's a maiden, a young woman. Now, what portion has God given me from above? Uh, has God given from above? And is there an inheritance given of the mighty one from the highest? And he answers his own question next. He says, yeah, certainly there is. So, in other words, there is a portion from God, but not just a portion of blessing. And that's what he's indicating here by asking that question and then answering it negatively, like in a bad sense. Alas, destruction to the unrighteous, and rejection to them that do iniquity. Iniquity means lawlessness. So, yes, there is a portion, there is an inheritance given by God from on high of destruction to the unrighteous and rejection of them that do lawlessness. And for those of you who say we're not under law, we're under grace. Remember from my previous videos here just recently, I've tried to clear that up for you. That it depends on what law you're talking about. It's not all law. 
because Paul himself says we're under law. He calls it the law of God, the law of Christ, and the law of the Spirit. And the law that leads to eternal life. He calls them all of those things and that we are under those. We have to choose between which law we're under. And the other law is not the law of Moses per se. It's the law of sin and death. That's the law we're not under. Let's keep going. So it says in verse 4, Will he not see my way and number all of my steps? And you say, that's like guiding me. No, that's not what he means. He says that God is watching. So he says, um, Will he not see my way, my road, my path, and number all my steps? He is looking so carefully, and he's paying attention and remembering everything you do, every step you take in your walk. So every time you walk and take a step, God sees it, he identifies it, and he remembers it step by step. That's how he's able to number all of my steps. Then he goes further with that to indicate that's exactly what he's talking about. But if I had gone with scorners, and if two, my foot had hasted to deceit. Okay? And in seven it says, if my foot has turned aside out of the way, out of the road. So clearly God is watching each step you make and remembering them all. Because when you step off of the way of truth, God sees that and God remembers that. That's what it's saying. But if I had gone with scorners, verse 5, and if too my foot has hasted to deceit, and you say, then what? Well, the then is down at the bottom in verse 8. Then let me sow and let others eat. Let me do all the work and not get to eat. Let me be uprooted on the earth, not have a place to call my own, a place where I reside, where I live, where my family lives. He says, but if I had gone with scorners, scorners, and if too my foot has hasted to deceit. So this is about deceit, but deceiving God as well. For I am weighed in a just balance, and the Lord knows my innocence. So Job, Job is reasserting his own real innocence in light of what God should do if he is just. So Job is then saying that these things are not true of me. He says, I am weighed in a just balance now, right now, in his circumstance. And the Lord knows my innocence. Does the Lord know your innocence? Are you innocent? Are you walking step by step carefully on the way of Christ to eternal life? If you are not, and you care not about it, you're on the broad path to hell. You are not on the narrow road that leads to eternal life. If you do not care about ordering your steps to stay on the road of Christ. If you say, Ron, I don't need to do that, because if I do sin, Christ will automatically forgive it, or you'll say, well, he's already forgiven it. Christ has already forgiven all my sins that I did and that I might do. But that's not scriptural. It's not there. It's not scriptural. And that tells me that you are on the broad path to hell because you do not care at all about watching your steps and ordering your steps to make sure you stay on the path of Christ, who is Christ. He says, I'm the way, that's path or road, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And the eternal life is the end of the path. So, and the truth is the gate. So when you enter through the truth, who is Jesus, on the path to walk that path, who is Jesus, to the final destination of eternal life, who is Jesus. And you order your steps accordingly to do that. Then you're walking the Christian walk. But if you're deceiving yourself into thinking that it doesn't matter, then you are doing the will of the enemy. We already did that in another video. We, we looked at the scriptures where it says specifically that, like Ephesians 2, John 3, 1 John 3. So let's see. Then he says, Verse 7, if my foot has turned aside out of the way, or if my heart has followed my eye. All right, let's wait there a minute and look back at verse 1 again, because there was one thing I didn't tell you about in the translation. It says, and I will not think upon a maiden. The word think is to assemble your thoughts together. So it's not just like a fleeting thought. It's where you purposely start putting things together, and you go, oh, what nice legs. You know, those are ideal for, for sex, you know, or other things like this. Or it doesn't even have to be about sex, specifically. 
But when you start assembling things like that together in your head, you are doing what Job is talking about here, that he made a covenant with his eyes about. I made a covenant with my eyes. I placed a contract to my eyes, and I will not assemble my thoughts upon a maiden. Okay? So that, then he goes down here and he says, if my, uh, if my heart has followed my eye. See? And that's what Jesus said. Where if you have looked at her with her in your heart, you already committed adultery. And he says, and if too I have touched gifts with my hands, it's corruption, gifts, then let me sow and let another, uh, and let others eat and let me be uprooted on the earth without a place to call my own. Now, if you want to be like Job and you don't want those curses from God to fall upon you, then I suggest that you make a covenant with your eyes. I suggest you control your thoughts to not assemble them together to follow your eyes, because that's your heart. Okay? So you do not let your heart follow your eyes into that. You keep a distance between those and control the heart. Okay? But even with the eyes, you're, it's a covenant with the eyes where you're going to control it. Okay? So, and I can't tell you how many times I've sat across the table from Christian leaders, pastors, deacons, doesn't matter who. And a girl walks by, whew, eyes go right with her. Skirt in the breeze as she walks by, he's like following that skirt and the legs. Yep, if she's got any kind of skin showing, which shouldn't be for a Christian woman, even if it's not a Christian woman, he looks, you know, and he follows the skin, even though he's a married man. That's right. It's a married man, he's looking at a Christian woman who's exposing her skin, wearing her skirt too short, or any of the things like that. And it doesn't have to be that. They don't have to expose the skin for that to happen. You can still look at the beauty of the woman, and you're a married man, and you're not supposed to be doing that. And you say, Ron, how can you help but notice if a, if a woman is beautiful? But see, there's a difference there between knowing the woman is beautiful, right, and tracking her with your eyes as she walks by. And then the next one, and you track her with your eyes as she walks by. And the ugly one that goes by doesn't look at. Men who go by, they don't look at. Only the pretty girls, or average to pretty girls. And they track them with their eyes. So, I call them on it. I say, what are you looking at? I say it like that. What are you looking at? Pastor, deacon, elder, I don't care. What are you looking at? I'll call them on it. Because when I'm sitting there with them and we're having a Christian conversation and I'm looking right along this line here that runs right down from anywhere from here up to here. But I'm not looking off over here or over there. I'm glued like that. The Lord taught me to use this principle in order to stay engaged and to control my eyes so they do not do that. I suggest that you get more serious about your walk with Christ. Because if you are doing this and you're sinning, you're unrighteous, or you're lawless, you're under the judgment of God. Yeah, you got an inheritance of wrath. Watch that video. Because it says so in the New Testament. That we no longer walk that way. And that when we do that, we are under God's wrath. We are a target of His wrath. I won't get into it again because I've already covered it adequately in that video. Go watch it. Don't be disrespectful by watching only part of the video. Watch the whole video. Watch the whole video. If you don't watch the whole video, and you miss the point, and you continue in your sin, then God will definitely send you to hell, because you will not stop your sin. You will be under God's wrath, and the video is here, and you've been led here to see the video, so that it can correct you and put you back onto the path who is Jesus and out of your sins. But if you don't pay respect for what God has put here for you and let it do the work it needs to do in you and on you, then your inheritance is the lake of burning sulfur. That's what it says here. What I just read you is the same thing. Look, he says, Now what portion 
Has God given from above? And is there an inheritance given of the mighty one from the highest? Alas, destruction to the unrighteous and rejection to them that do iniquity. Turn with me to Revelation 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part, that's their portion, that's their inheritance, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's irrevocable. This is the eternal torment that you've heard about, not hell. It says that hell is going to be thrown into this place. Hell is temporary. Hell is a temporary place for you, but it's going to be thrown into this place. After it empties out, it's dead to be judged. And then you, who will, be, who will be judged because of your unrighteousness, your sin, no matter what you say about what you think about Jesus, you will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. It clearly says it again and again and again. And this book of Revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, that's what it's called at the very beginning of the book, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ is written to Christians. It even starts out with a letter to seven churches. This is not for non-believers. This is for Christians. And so when it says this, it's saying it to you. That if you are doing these things, just like Paul said in that video, you'll see it. Just like Paul said in many of those passages, we covered Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Romans, where Paul says it again and again and again and again and again. If you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus completes that thought. You will inherit the lake of burning sulfur. No matter what you think about Jesus. Because you're not saved by faith alone. You're not. It's the grace of God in which we stand. It's through faith. Faith is not alone. It's not an end product. Faith is not the end of it, of our salvation. Faith is a byway. And it's through faith, and it's with works, because Jacob, a.k.a. James, says clearly faith without works is dead. Faith without deeds, actions, is dead. It cannot save you. You cannot get to salvation through faith that has no works. The bridge is down. And we're going to be judged by works. It says again and again and again that God will judge every human being by what he has done. And he is not partial. He says he's not partial. That means if you say, I believe in Jesus, he's not partial to you. He's still going to judge you on what you did. The difference is that we've got the power of Christ to do what's right and to stop sinning. You've got the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you don't avail yourself of it before the judgment day, you've got no one else to blame but yourself because you knew about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You knew about it. And you didn't avail yourself of it. You became a lazy Christian. Not a Christian at all. Indeed. Because you were lawless. You were unrighteous and lawless sinner. And you never stopped sinning. And Jesus had mercy and long-suffering hoping that you would turn from your sin and repent. Exercise your mind in the midst of the occasion. That's what the word in the Greek means for repent. It means to exercise your mind, the strength of your mind, in the midst of every occasion from then on out. And you didn't do that. But you can do that with the strength of the Holy Spirit applying the blood of Jesus Christ and His power and the name of Christ in your situation so you could overcome it. Yeah? I'll show you. One more and that'll be it for this video. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And this is the condemnation that stands against you who refuse to stop sinning. And you make excuses. Oh, the thief on the cross. Watch my videos in the playlist on the thief on the cross where I rebuke you for insulting and disrespecting a new brother in the Lord who was a quadriplegic and yet did everything he could with the last moments of his life he had left. And you say, well, I don't have to do any more than him. No, nope. lazy. You're not even a Christian because you don't know Christ. And I'm going to read this to you, what God says about temptation for you, for your sake. It says here, therefore, verse 12, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. When you sin, you fall. God is saying through Paul, take heed, take caution not to fall. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
pay attention so you don't fall, so you don't sin. Let's keep going. The context is about sin. He goes on. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So, what? You think this is an unusual temptation? Some exception to what everyone else experiences? No. He says no. God says no through Paul by the Holy Spirit. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. God will not allow it for everyone. Each and every person, God will not allow them to be tempted beyond what they can stand up under in order to not sin. So if you say, I can't help but sin as long as I'm in the body, you make God a liar. Because he just said, through Paul, says God is faithful. You're saying God's unfaithful. Holy Spirit says God's faithful. You say God is unfaithful. Because you say you can't help but sin as long as you're in the body. It means God is not faithful. Because this says that God is faithful by not allowing you to be tempted beyond what you can stand up under. And you say, I can't stand up under it. At some point, there's going to be a temptation I can't stand up under and I'm going to sin. That means that God stops being faithful at some point according to you. And you make God a liar. You'd better take heed. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. You are able. But with the temptation will also make so first he makes it so you can stand under it, but with the temptation he will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And yet you say, by your wicked demonic doctrine, that calls God a liar, calls God unfaithful. Well, God's faithful is just me. That's not what this says. That is not what this says. This is that temptation. You say you can't help but sin. That means it's not you. You're claiming you cannot help but sin, which means it's not you, it's something else or someone else that is causing you to sin at some point so that you can never stop sinning. And yet God says here, you can and must stop sinning. All right, now we understand Job. In the New Testament, light of the New Testament, in God's testimony, we understand Job. It is still applicable today. Make a covenant with your eyes. Do not assemble your thoughts of your heart in order to chase after with your eyes things that you should not be looking at. Stay on the path who is Jesus. Do not let your foot get off the path. May the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart.